Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Stefan Armbruster. Um, I work for more than three years now as a field engineer with new technology. Um, and during the internal briefing this morning, oh. during the internal briefing this morning, um, Claudia, our um, um, the person who organized the full event, asked us to be positive and honest. And so, should I be positive or honest? <laughs> as, as, as a field engineer, you see all things going wrong, uh, so you probably have a kind of, there is positive and honest, there is not too much overlap. So I try to be a little bit positive and mostly honest. Okay. Um, yeah, this talk is about scaling Neo4j applications. So the, most of the deck was mostly stolen by my colleague Ian. So kudos to Ian for creating these wonderful slides. Yeah, let's, let's go through that. So um, you probably know this kind of burden of success. So you create an application. It is well received by your users. Um, you get a lot of people more signing up. Uh, this creates a lot larger data sets. You suffer from more concurrent queries, more complex queries. Uh, you see then uh, failures that previously weren't there. So it um, becomes a mess. And getting rid of that situation is always hard. So basically, none of these large web properties who have gone through the scaling um, need went f through that as a kind of easy walk. So you, it's always a hard way to go through that. So it always means effort, regardless of the technology. And if anyone tells you we can scale indefinitely without any, any hassle, they're basically lying. Uh, that was the honest part. Uh, so it doesn't come for free. To do a successful scaling of your application, you basically first you need to do is understand the, the needs and have an understanding on how things will evolve in future and already have in mind what the next order of magnitude of your application should be. Typically, you do this in a very iterative and incremental approach for your um, development cycle. Um, this comes with uh, typically unit tests. Well, everyone talks about uh, test-first approaches, but honestly, who really does test-first here? Yeah. Okay. And whom of you are lying? <laughs> okay. So, every, seriously, you should do test-first. It's a hard. It's hard to learn that practice. Uh, I know for myself, and always you say, okay, now it's it's urgent. I need to fix that this evening. Let's skip test-first. Just write the code and good. Uh, once you do this you get out of the test first approach. So try to stick with that. You, by the unit test, you basically assert that um, the application does what, it's, what it is supposed to do, but it does not prove that it does the, the right things when under high load conditions. So hand by hand with the unit tests, you typically want to have performance tests. So you run your application against not a tiny data set that is valid for unit testing, you run your tests versus a data set that has the, the size or the shape of your production graph on hardware that is as similar as possible to the production machines. Of course, in a lot of cases, you cannot afford production machines uh, paying twice, um, but with current um, virtualization technologies, you can just spin up a cluster for an hour when you really run the performance test and shut it down again on EC2 or whatever. Um, thing. So the idea is basically you need to understand the, the performance effects of your changes as soon as possible. So if you, for example, you change um, some query um, and you don't do performance tests regularly, you oh. will run do the performance test only before the next deployment. Um, then the day before the deployment, you see, oh, my performance is going bad. And then you look back, all the changes you've done in the last four weeks, uh, what could have caused that? If you run the performance test on the night, uh, every day or every night, you typically have a clear understanding of what you've done the last day, so it's much more easy to roll that back. So please, that, that's, a, that's an advice from practice. Focus not only on the unit test and run them on every commit, focus also on having an automated performance test suite in place and run this probably every night. Not on every commit, but at least in, in short cycles. Together with performance tests, you also want to do monitoring you want to monitor your, um, 
your production system to understand how it behaves, how fast a lot graph grows. When you, for example, there is in one of the early versions of NeoVJ, there was a serious problem when you run out of disk space, this uh, caused data corruption, pretty bad. This has fixed a long time ago already, but still you should monitor for, for disk space and some other parameters that you can plan ahead. So if you know that I'm probably running out of disk space in four weeks, you have enough time to, to organize something. If you just hit the limit and say, projection stop, we're out of this space, then it's, it's urgent to, and, and it's hard to fix things. For, for this talk, I will focus on how we can scale reads, which is one side, and also on how we can scale writes. And if time is left, I want to switch a little bit on how hard, what hardware, or what the effects of different hardware might be to, to your performance. Um, yes, yeah, scaling the reads is mostly about latency. So um, typically, um, you know, relational databases, um, when you do complex joins, in the best case scenario, the join scales logarithmically to the data set size. Because internally, they build a tree for the join, binary tree, and that's logarithmic scale. Uh, in a graph world, um, the database, as, as the relationships are stored locally, with nodes, a query is independent of the graph size. How is that? So the latency of a query is typically a function of the search size, so the amount of nodes you visit during a, a query. Let's ma make a short example. So you have here a small graph, and let's assume a query touches a certain part of that, so that amount. And if we now have a way larger graph, like that, and we run the same query, so we have the same search area, like that, so we, it's exactly the same pattern we have here. That is typically returned in the same time. So a, a native graph database like NeoVJ typically um, scales independently of the data size for local queries. Well, this is a local query, right? So you start somewhere and you do something in the direct environment. The search, the search area, so if you have a larger search area, of course this will be slower because it, you touch much more nodes. This search area is typically a function of the domain invariance. So think about um, some, some absolute um, limitations. So let's say a social network where every user has 50 friends. And I know some social networks out there which have a limitations on the number of connections you can make exactly for that purpose. So if you, you, they don't allow you to explode or to change the domain invariance. Uh, so in this case, the domain invariance stays independent or stays the same for a growing data size. Another, um, if, if this domain invariance change and the search area change, so let's assume that a user uh, is connected with 10% of your complete user base, then that will grow. And that thing then, of course, makes your query slower as your data set grows. And that is, it's, Therefore, it's really important to understand the shape of your, your size. How does it change over time in terms of density of connections, um, in terms of new concepts that you introduce while the project is evolving? Yeah, that, that's the main uh, driver for, for uh, read latency. So typically, um, if you have a cipher query and you think it's too slow, well, there are basically two approaches how to solve that. The one thing is you can try to t do tweaks and improve the cipher query itself. Uh, you can change the underlying data model to make the data uh, base more <coughs> query friendly. Uh, in not sure if you attended the modeling talks, but I think one of the key messages there was um, you model like you think the, the domain is structured or like on a whiteboard and then you validate that approach versus your query patterns which is a, bit, a little bit different from relational modeling. Um, and the third approach is you refactor your cipher query into unmanaged extension. Unmanaged extension sounds a little bit a strange word. It's basically a piece of Java code. Uh, you write, uh, you compile the char file out of that, and you drop the char file onto the server, and that char file gets exposed as a new REST endpoint, and then inside the Unmixed extension, you use core API or traversal API. So you're really pretty close to the machine and you can use a lot of domain knowledge in that kind of queries. 
Of course, if you compare a cipher query of two or three lines, if you write that as in Java code, it might end up in hundreds of lines. So this adds a lot of additional code, which you have to write, which you have to test, which you have to maintain. And if you go back, uh, if you come back to your code half a year later, a cipher query is something you can almost immediately understand. But understanding 500 lines of Java code in a second, well, I cannot do that. Maybe you can. So uh, I don't want to focus on cipher optimization. There is a lot of information out there on, on the internet. So just a few hints. So what you typically do, you should try to have not one very complex query. You should split up a cipher query in smaller parts and try to terminate certain branches as early as possible. Therefore, there is the lovely statement with. Anyone not knowing what with in Cypher is? OK, so you have attended the trainings and a lot of talks. Wonderful. So, and also, a good advice is you should always start from the cheap side. So try to use low cardinality nodes for, for as starting points. So if you have a node let's, that has, um, let's say, 100 million of outgoing relationships, and you follow them, well, of course, the query will be slow because you follow 100 million things. And that's even with the speed of, of Neo 4 j slow. Um, there I have a reference to some blog posts um, that focus more on, on optimizing Cypher. So in, for, if you decided to change the model for improved uh, read performance, the goal is basically we want to do for the same query less work in the graph. Um, so we want to reduce the, the size that we really need to traverse. What we can do is we can infer new relationships and add shortcuts to the graph. Uh, let me give you an example. So we have here a graph uh, where we have people working on some projects. And we want to find the co-workers. So we, we start at a, at a person, Ben, here. And Ben is apparently in the room at the very end here. Hi, Ben. Uh, ben worked on a project. And we look for colleagues who worked on the same project. So if we look at this query, we, we basically need to identify a start point. Then we follow a relationship below the node. We follow another relationship, and we're at the target node. If we would make the fact that Ben and Ian work together in a project explicit, we could introduce new relationships in between them. So uh, instead of that query string, uh, we could introduce work with relationships. So in this case, the, to find the co-workers of Ben would be reduced to follow only a single relationship. So by that, we probably made that query 50% faster. But it comes with a cost. Adding new relationships basically means we have more expensive rights because every time we add a new person or a new project, we need to check if they're um, co-workers already and connect them, check uh -huh. if we don't have duplicates. So we get more data, we get more expensive rides, but we benefit on cheaper reads. It's always, there is no free lunch, except during the Graph Connect. <laughs> and apparently, um, so it's since much more of you guys were attending than expected, um, our management asked us not to eat from the official lunch. We had some separate sandwiches in, um, in a separate room. All for you guys. <laughs> Yeah, the question is also when should we add these inferred relationships? Of course, we can add within the same transaction, like um, either explicitly or we are transaction event handler. We can, pro uh, we can queue it for a subsequent transaction, or we can have some periodic background job. Which one is the best? <coughs> Typically, consultant answer it depends. It depends on how real time or how real time critical your queries are. So if, if it's, uh, I think, doing the batch thing is, is okay if you have, in the, have a kind of um, different distribution of the load over the day, so in the typically night um, downtime where no one hits the system, then you can, that's a good window for doing this kind of batch operations. But in other cases, if you really want to have the shortcuts um, immediately or also extremely consistent, then you need to do it within the same transaction. And then, of course, the writes get massively more expensive. You can also refactor then existing data. We have here, so that would basically be a kind of query to um, 
if you later on the project decide to introduce these work with statements, you have this as a kind of migration script. So you look for all the pairs of people who work together, um, but exclude those who already have a work with relationship, and then you just merge the new um, work with relationship between the two people, and you return the count. When doing this kind of migrations, consider also transaction size. So if consider a large graph of multi-million people, so we will end up, if you emit that statement, having, um, well, of course, we have already a limit here, so it makes sense. But if you omit the limit here, uh, you would have millions of changes in a single transaction that will for sure cause out of memory exceptions. So all these huge changes always use a limit and report back the, amount, the amount of changes you have done and run this, this statement over and over again until the returning value is zero. Then you know you have changed all the things. There is also for this kind of data migrations upcoming or um, from our community a framework called LiquiGraph. Do you know in the relational world tools like LiquiBase? It's basically you treat changes to your relational schema as part of your code base and the same is uh, possible for for Neo4j now with LiquiBase. It's very early stage but very, very um, good approach to keep your code changes in sync with the data migrations. Uh, unmanaged extensions. As already um, said, you basically do um, queries by the Cypher endpoint or by the transactional Cypher endpoint. So by you send your Cypher statements through the REST API to the machine. And the unmanaged extensions you write on your own expose themselves as new REST endpoint like here. <coughs> there is a lot of different blog posts out there how to write that. Let's a little bit look into that. The code I'm showing here is, so with 2.2 you would write it a little bit differently, so that is a valid example for up to 2.1. Let's go through that code a little bit. And how much Java developers do we have in the room? Okay, so for the answers, the next five minutes might be a little bit boring, sorry. <laughs> so uh, what we do in this uh, code, uh, basically you drive the way uh, extension is exposed to the world by JAXRS annotations. JAXRS annotations is nothing that we've invented, it's a Java standard. So you put here path um, annotations, you care about um, content types, about parameters, and that, that should be a GET request. So whenever you send a GET request to similar skills slash name, with, with a, um, then you end up in that method. Um, you need to provide some context. Uh, you can run Cypher from within an Unmanix extension. Um, you probably know to run Cypher from Java, you need an execution engine. What I've seen pretty frequently is that you create a new execution engine in the extension itself. So that means you create for each request a new execution engine. That is bad because the query cache is tied to the execution engine and by creating it over and over again, you basically uh, get completely rid of the caching effects here. Luckily, we expose um, the execution engine that is already there in Neo4j uh, as a context to your extension by that thing. So you basically need to have a context annotation on a Cypher executor class. That thing is never nowhere documented <laughs> to make it easy. Uh, once you have the Cypher executor, uh, you can on that one you can call get execution engine. And this makes sure that you always use the same execution engine, which makes you benefiting a lot from, um, from the query plan caching. So in 2.2, you would have on the graph database service class a method execute. So you don't have to mess around with that thing anymore because too many people uh, failed to do that correctly. So forget a little bit about that. That's legacy. But you first need to learn the pain to understand the beautiness, right? <laughs> this was more honest, less positive, sorry. <laughs> we want to get close to the data. So typically, or let's assume we have a single request with many operations to reduce the network latencies. So if you have a lot of single requests, sometimes you can put them into one batch request. So you have something like that. So in, in Cypher, you can do batching in the extensions. We see here you have, a lot, you have much more choice of technology you can use. 
So it, within these, these unmanaged extensions, you can use as a high-level technology cipher. And you, there's multiple steps to go down more closer to the machine. There's the traversal framework, which is a kind of fluent API interface. There is the graph algo package, which is very powerful. Um, and there's the core API, at the, which are you already pretty much to the bare metal. So on the core API, you talk about nodes and relationships, and you do explicit traversals. You can also, with the extensions, control the format completely. So you can render JSON, uh, CSV, also some binary things can be rendered. And uh, I'm aware of more than one customer who directly renders Excel documents from Unmix extensions. So you have the full, everything that is available in Java ecosystem can be used there. Uh, one thing that typically people don't pay much attention to is HTTP headers. So I was once on a project, this is years ago, I don't disclose the name here. Um, they fiddled also around with unmanaged extensions and they copied an uh, example with a post request. And um, they said, okay, that works nicely. So they copy and pasted that for every extension they wrote. Even for requests that only read data, they sent post requests. Then there was, well, how can, can we benefit from caching? Yeah, let's put this nice reverse proxy in front of that. But these reverse proxies typically cache get calls. So you should always use the headers and the HP as it is, was intended originally. Read the specs and don't stupidly copy over examples. <laughs> These um, unmanaged extensions are also a very good candidate to integrate other systems. So there was a question recently, can you um, integrate Neo4j with Kerberos? It's not on the feature list, but yes, you can. Just write the extension that does some cover stuff. So it's just the integration code you have to write. So for example, in this extension, you can communicate with a relational database or with an LDAP. You can even hide other data sources behind that. So um, assume you want to write something like uh, Instagram. And uh, if you uh, attended one of the basic sessions, you probably know that you should not use Neo4j as a blob store. So when you want to clone Instagram, you uh, but it's a good idea to have um, the metadata of the images, the people and all that stuff in a graph, but the raw image data in a graph as a byte array property is technically possible, but absolute nonsense. So you want to put that one into a separate store like Amazon S3. Um, and with the unmixed extension, you can hide that separation that you have parts of your thing in the graph and other parts in uh, a separate data store. So you basically hide the graph database behind that which is also from architecture perspective, an uh, interesting pattern. And a lot of commercial customers I'm aware of have exactly that approach. They have implemented all their logic in unmanaged extensions and hide the use of the graph database as an implementation detail. Typically, you start off using Cypher and for some uh, requests, you decide to go um, unmanaged extensions. So you typically then try to first run the Cypher statement inside an extension and then you go down and refactor that implementation into traversal or whatever, what other technology comes into mind here. So that's a kind of step-by-step -step approach and always measure that. So you need to know how much, what, how much did I get from that step so, and only do a few changes at a time to understand the effects of a certain optimization you did. And also word of warnings on these extensions. Uh, if you call system exit, it will work. Um, yeah, so as you know, Enterprise Edition in Neo4j has a uh, clustering feature. So this cluster feature is a master-slave replication, so it scales almost linearly for, for read operations. So every cluster member has a full copy of the graph, so that means every read operation can be run on any cluster member independently without any cluster intercommunication. So scaling reads is as easy as adding machines. In marketing slang, that means we scale horizontally for, right, for reads. Since it's a master slave replication, you typically want to have a kind of um, two load balancers, one for the writes, another one for, for the reads. So the reads are typically sent to the slaves or to the master, and the writes are typically only always sent to the master node. That has some implications. I don't want to go in detail on that. You have uh, example HTTP proxy configuration for that. So you need the load balancer, which is not part of Neo4j. That is a sample configuration. I don't want to go in detail on that right now. There is uh, the cluster instances. 
have an HTTP endpoint that exposes the cluster status so the load balancer can be aware of who is currently master and who, who is slave. So to point the right request to the right machine. So um, there's another technique. So let's assume we have a load balancer and we have a request that is getting sent to that machine that hits some certain amount of the graph. And then we send another request for, so we have a request here for Australia that gets sent to this machine and the load balancer decides to send the query for Norway also on that machine. That might cause some issues because um, you know Neo4j has a cache and in some cases the cache, you cannot run a fully cached graph because you have not enough RAM. So maybe that query will override the cache from the previous one. So you always run basically uncached. There is a technique to come around that um, by some consistent routing, which is called cache sharding. So the load balancer has some smartness in that. So the load balancer says, okay, every country that starts from A to I is, hit, is sent to instance one, J to R to instance two, and S to Z to instance three. By that, a request hitting the same region of the graph is always sent to the right, to the same machine over and over again, which means the caches have in the ideal world distinct contents and therefore if you can afford one third of, of the full uh, graph in cache on a single machine with three instances you have 100% cache coverage. That is called cache sharding. That is what you can do rather easily. And in a lot of cases um, the setting up that thing is, is not too hard. So um, in typical scenarios people use the J session ID as, as a routing parameter for that. Or something like that. But you need some knowledge here on how to do that, which depends on your domain. So uh, let's go to the right side. So this was a little bit on the read side. Some problems you might consider when hitting high write rates is that you get log contention and um, also about uh, some transaction state. Let's go a little bit on that. Um, so to, you want to basically try to delay the, the expensive operations as far as possible and also consider if you have a way to queue or batch writes. We have some support in the product for that right now. So contented nodes, when, when you basically cr create a relationship, that means you lock the start node, you lock the relationship and you lock the end node. And if you concurrently um, create a lot of transactions that connect to the same node that con creates contention. So that is something you need to identify them and involve them as late as possible in the transaction or even better you can surround that node by some proxy nodes. That's a pretty much advanced concept. So this delaying as an example, so assume you, we have here a device that is highly contended so a lot of people want to write to that and we have a kind of event list for that device. So uh, building a list contains the first relationship and we want to indicate the last in this list with the last relationship and now we want to add alerts. So what we could do naively would be, well, we create here a new node, we connect that and do that. We add another one. So we get a lot of writes on that one. So if, but what we could do in, instead of uh, that we create this linked list up front, so we connect the three nodes here and we do the last relationship on the first relationship uh, at the very end. So that means the time that node is locked for other transactions is as short as possible. That is, that is a good strategy. The same applies to Cypher. So if you have multiple create merge statements, you can apply the same technique. Also queuing. This is now uh, only valid for versions up to 2.1. So you basically, um, concurrent requests tend not to be fast because at the end of the day, um, they get queued up internally in Neo4j, especially if you have a lot of small transactions. So the, the recipe was basically to create, to have somewhere a queue, so to write to a queue, and then the, consume, the queue is consumed single-threaded um, and applied to the graph. That was the recipe for, for, for that kind of operation up till 2.1. Uh, so you could either put this queue into your application or you could put the queue as an extension to Neo4j as a custom code um, to make that happen. Luckily in 2.2 we integrated a feature called batch writes uh, which is in cases where you have a lot of concurrent small writes 
you can get a write throughput of up to 100x compared to previous versions. I want to introduce that guy, Max DeMarcy, one of my colleagues. He has written up a lot of blog posts on, on the scaling write issues. Please go there and, and read through that. That's an excellent resource. And I think on the hardware side, I just leave that up to you to read through the slide deck um, as we distribute it. Um, in the other room, there's now a project um, uh, presented that I was involved in with Adidas. Well, I will probably attend that talk, but I still have some room for some questions. Thank you.